that out of the way. Um, uh, just a quick overview of the agenda. Um, we start with introductions. Uh, just a reminder that the past meeting notes as well as the recordings are posted on the Project Wildfire website. Um, take a look at those if you have any corrections or updates uh, to those. Feel free to send them my way. Um, um, I'm going to give a quick program update, then we're going to spend the bulk of the meeting on uh, a few Firewise communities that have volunteered to talk about their most recent projects. Um, and then we'll try to save a little bit of time for a uh, round table if we have some time at the end. Um, so with that, I will dive into a really quick update and then I want to save most of the time for our main topic. Um, uh, some have already asked, but I'm sure a lot of wondering um, the status of filling in uh, our fire adapted communities coordinator uh, position that Boone similarly vacated. Um, we uh, have not had that filled quite yet. I hope to get it filled here shortly. So look for an announcement on that. Um, the other main announcement that I wanted to make sure that folks were aware of, hopefully you got uh, an email about this, but if not, um, uh, let me know through email and I will, I will get you the information. But we did announce that the opening of our uh, uh, discretionary fuels reduction grants for this fiscal year that just started in July. Uh, so that is open now. Um, the information's on the web. You can find it in a couple places. Uh, we have uh, uh, the news about it posted at the shoots.org forward slash news. It'll probably be about the fourth article down. Uh, and or uh, if you want the grant application with the kind of guidelines for what we're looking for for projects, which hasn't changed a lot from last year, uh, you can go to the shoots.org forward slash grants. Uh, there are just a couple documents there. One is the document on fuel reduction. Uh, Similar, almost the same application. Um, we are offering a couple, or I am offering, who's we, right? When I'm just one person. <laughs> uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, hopefully it'll be we again soon. Um, uh, but I, I'm offering two chances if you have questions or want to learn more about the details of how we um, kind of score those applications. Uh, in August, so uh, one's a virtual option. I believe it's August second. If I'm remembering correctly, uh, uh, that's the virtual one. You do have to register in advance to get the link. Um, and again, if you look up that uh, announcement, that that registration link's there. Um, or if you can't find it, email and I can forward it to you. Uh, the other option is in person at the Shoots County Road Department. That'll be on the tenth. Uh, so the the Virtual options in the morning, the in-person options in the afternoon. Hopefully one of those works for you um, to come and find out more. It's not a requirement that you attend those meetings, but if you want to find out like, more. Good morning, they're signing in or something. I don't know what to do. <laughs> hopefully, uh, hopefully it's fairly straightforward, but happy to um, kind of run through that in those, those meetings. So we'll have an hour, an hour and a half to... Um, uh, just a reminder for those folks online. Yeah, thank you. Um, you keep yourself muted um, if you're not, if you don't have a question. So, um, okay, uh, those were my updates. Um, uh, and with that, I am going to kind of introduce our, our main um, topic. Uh, which is uh, thought it'd take uh, a, a month and set aside for Firewise Communities. Our Firewise Communities program uh, here in Shoots County has really, um, I guess I would say, exploded over the last year or so. Um, I, I think in the last year we've added somewhere in the neighborhood about 20 communities, uh, and we're sitting at a little over 60. Last I saw, uh, both um, fully through the process and pending, we're at 67, I think, 60-something fully through the process and about six or seven pending. Um, and we have several more uh, that are interested that we haven't met with yet. So I uh, thought I'd take a little bit of time and kind of feature uh, both because we've opened up this grant opportunity, but also because we've just closed out our last year's grant opportunity, uh, give the chance for a few communities um, 
that were willing to go ahead and present on what they did. And hopefully this will be kind of a, a good opportunity for communities to learn from each other, uh, ask questions of each other, and or you know, even after the meeting, uh, use each other as resources now that we do have upwards of 60 plus communities. Uh, there's, there's lots of uh, activities going on, and, and I can say if you're in a community trying to figure out a project, there's probably somebody else uh, that, that's kind of in the same boat. So that this is that's the purpose of this meeting today is to kind of feature a few of those and see what lessons were learned and uh, what projects um, are happening out there. And I'm just going to start real briefly with one. Um, they because they couldn't uh, make it, they've had a changeover in uh, Firewise leads, but thought it was an interesting um, project. And then I'm I'm just going to go down my list, um, and it's kind of first come first serve. The first person I, I heard from, uh, and we're we're going to go down the list from there. Um, and I don't I haven't confirmed that every single person is here in the meeting today, but I, I I've seen a number of people, um, and I would just ask and remind people uh, to try to take. Uh, just about five minutes. I, I know five minutes is enough time to go in depth with any project, but it'll hopefully be enough time to kind of feature your project uh, and maybe pique a little interest in people if they want to follow up with more questions. So uh, with that, I will just start with Sage Meadow uh, just as a just as an example. Um, just threw a couple slides up here um, on a project that was uh, uh, done out in Sage Meadows. So Sage Meadows community um, north of Sisters in the unincorporated county. Uh, they applied for a, a, a grant. Uh, I originally met out there with them. They have a large commons area and they were thinking of doing commons areas. And I, I told the Firewise lead, really, it's hard to think about you working in the commons area when you have flammable shrubbery that, that you know, is uh, what, what I would describe as little cans of gasoline right next to homes. Uh, so I really encourage them to uh, think about a project that might prioritize removal of some of those flammable shrubs. So uh, she did that, uh, essentially kind of put a bounty on, <laughs> on shrubs next to the house. And so they really focused on uh, zero to five foot zone removal of flammable shrubs uh, for their project. So just a couple before and after pictures of that with the uh, with, uh, um, carbonated juniper type um, shrubs that we all know and, and hate, hopefully, um, <laughs> next to a lot of homes. So uh, again, just a, just a few examples of the, the before and after with the, with the super flammable shrubbery and then that removed. Um, uh, and another one here, again, just kind of targeting those shrubs. So I just thought I'd throw that out as kind of a, a starter not going to go into a lot of detail because I don't live there, but I just thought it was kind of a cool project, uh, really focused on that zero to five foot zone that we want people to really be focused in on. Uh, because if you've if you've got great irrigated lawn and <laughs> your common areas are all thin, but you still have that flammable shrubbery touching the home, uh, you're not quite there in the central space. <laughs> so really exciting to see uh, projects like this. We had a few other projects like this that really focused in on the zero to five foot zone. Um, so I just wanted to kind of to feature that. Um, so um, anyway, that's just a, a little starter. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Ray, who's the first on my list. So Ray. You want to take it away and give us a little uh, overview of what was happening at uh, Woodside Ranch. Thank you, Ed, and good morning, everybody. Um, Woodside Ranch, we've been doing a defensible space. We try to make an annual project uh, since 2003. We are Firewise community. Uh, this year, we took out about 4,500 to 5,000 cubic yards of what are called semi-compressed material. It all depends on how much the uh, contractor is willing, is able to compress it before he takes it to the dump. Um, that's about the same as we've done every year, which is kind of confusing to me in a way. You think Mother Nature couldn't put back that much every year, but she does. <laughs> Our main concern, we live right at the Wui. We're bordered by the Deschutes Forest and BLM lands. Um, we are mostly pine trees, pine, uh, junipers, rabbit brush, bitter brush, um, 
and ornamentals that people have put it in when they buy their homes. Our main thing has been since 2004, we've been doing fire education. We found that educating people about the dangers of wildfire, what's going to happen when it comes, and how they can help to prevent their homes from burning when there's not going to be any firefighters uh, because of our limited resources coming to defend their homes, that it's really up to the homeowners to defend themselves before the fire comes. So we've done zero to five feet. Most families have taken care of that. Um, we've gone out to 30 to 50 feet. Uh, our main problem, well, our, our real, really good thing has been fire education, using our newsletter and our website to educate people year after year about what to do to protect their homes, why homes start to burn, all about the new science of embers starting fires, and also how their homes are constructed, especially looking at their uh, eaves, the vents in the eaves, going from quarter inch to eighth inch uh, wire mesh screening has been a big thing. Uh, our problem mainly has been, so we've been pretty successful over the years, but our big problem has been one, of course, money. Without the uh, Deschutes County grant each year, we really can't afford to keep doing this program. Ours is sweat equity where people bring the debris out to the, uh, the street side for a paid contractor to haul it away. Uh, but we only have a $50 sort of mandatory do annual dues, which does not cover this cost. Uh, our big problem has always been new homeowners moving in who don't understand what's going on. And really their attitude is, it's my property, I'll do what I want. And trying to make them understand it's a community problem for wildfire. If your house, if your neighbors, if your house is, has defensible space, but your neighbor's house does not, it's gonna be a problem for both of you and for the whole community. And the other has been, as I said, finance. And the third problem really has been uh, being able to find contractors who are willing to come out and do this in a time constrained period during fire free. If we were able to do this um, throughout the year, like with uh, yard service, it would greatly relieve the pressure on us both financially and logistically. Some of the things we found really work well for us. We put a sign up list, a you know, sign up sheet for anyone who wants to participate. And we put a drop dead date for signing up. And that's usually about two to three weeks before the start of our program so that we can manage the program ourselves on the ground and let the contractor know who is participating. The second great thing is we have a drop dead date for bringing out debris. You can't let people can bring out debris all the time, all the way up to when the contractor is coming. So we have a drop dead date a week before the project starts. And then we also have a summary, a follow-up for all the homeowners to tell them how well they've done and then restart the education program again throughout the year. But again, thanks to Deschutes County, to Ed and all the commissioners for their support every year for this program. We really appreciate that. All right, thanks, Ray. And I'm gonna hold questions till the end so that we make sure and get down our list. Uh, so thank you for presenting. Uh, Dean, I know you just joined, so uh, I can give you a minute and we can move to Elizabeth with the parks. Uh, if you wanna take it away, then we'll circle back to her. So yes, my name is Elizabeth Whitey, and I live in the parks in here at Bend, and we're um, right across the street from the top of the Tories. And um, we just started our Firewise community activities about four years ago. Um, Boone came out and walked through the neighborhood with us, and so we wrote up the assessment, and then we wrote a plan, and then we applied for the grant, and we received the grant last year. And um, our neighborhood is about 24 and a half acres. Um, we have about 206 lots of which about 152 are resident, residents or homeowners. We have a lot of uh, people with second homes and then about 51 of the uh, 
residents of our renters. Um, so in May, uh, coordinating with the, uh, the county's Garwise weekend, we have our weekend, and we put out this year, last year we put out four dumpsters and they were over full. This year we put out eight dumpsters and they were full. Um, and so we pretty much, we don't really come to houses and collect. We, we put the dumpsters throughout the neighborhood. We give, we send out um, notices, which let's see, but we send out a flyer to all the homeowners that basically says what we're doing, when we're doing it, where, the, and then we send a map that shows where the dumpsters are located. And then we tell them what goes in the dumpsters and what doesn't go in the dumpsters. Um, this year, I actually added um, wood chips from your from the lawns, uh, in addition to wheat, eagles, and bones, all that. Um, trying to encourage, we're trying to educate as well, um, but we're trying to encourage people to um, use more fire safe uh, materials in their yards. Um, and then I am. Uh, we don't have a lot of resistance like Ray was talking about because we're, we're a pretty tight community. Um, the houses are pretty close together. The, so people are very good about cleaning up. We have a few residents who can't because of physical problems, and so we just help them out. Um, and then we turn them around their leaves, cleaning out their gutters. Kind of um, we do uh, have had a contractor come out. Uh, we used our grant money for contractors and the dumpsters. And the contractors, we have an area that's an open space that's originally going to be a park. We have a couple of parks that are very well maintained by our landscapers, but we have some open space parks that are not maintained by anybody. And um, so this year we spent the bulk of the money cleaning up one of those areas that we call the Adventure Park. And that area was uh, super hazardous. Um, and so we also have paths between homes where nobody really maintains. And then we have some open space um, around the perimeter of the neighborhood. So I'm, in addition to education, I'm really focused on the open spaces and trying to figure out how to get funding because it's not in our HOA fees to keep those areas fire, fire safe. Um, and so we either need to increase fees or we need to grant money or we need to get new residents involved. Or we need some way that we can't just ignore our open spaces because they are definitely dangerous. Um, and then, let's see. Oh, we did put together a, um, a newsletter uh, and it was beautiful. We have a guy who's a CNN documentary, something or other retiree in our neighborhood. And so he has done some <laughs> really amazing videos. Um, so our fireway stuff is pretty cool. <laughs> but, <laughs> I'm happy to share it with you. Yeah, they, those Spark newsletters are pretty, pretty cool. Pretty amazing. Yeah. yeah, Jack Hammond. Yeah, yeah. yeah if you, yeah, he, uh, he and his wife, Leslie. You don't mind resending me those links so I don't oh. have to try to dig them up from. Yeah, well, from yeah. a year or so. Yeah, they're so pretty I, amazing. I'd love we to were, share those out in the notes. I was just talking to them this weekend um, about doing some more stuff, not only for our neighborhood, but just our education overall community. Um, but one of the other big interests of mine is coordinating with our surrounding communities. We're, a, we're adjacent to Tether Road, and um, we're adjacent to one of Tether Road's large open spaces. Um, and my concern is that maybe we don't catch fire, but one of our neighbors does, and it just kind of soars in. Um, and so I'm trying to coordinate with some of their firewise people, and that's one reason I'm glad I have for this meeting, because I think seriously, we all as neighbors need to be coordinating, not only on what are we doing, but um, helping each other out, um, communicating with our activities. So, um, oh, and the last thing I want to mention is we have a one way in, one way out with parks, which is kind of scary, but we also have two fire gates. And so what we've done since we started our committee is um, we've given the code to the fire gate to a couple of the residents so that we can, so we, the fire people can't get there in time, we can open the gates um, for evacuation. And then um, I'm trying to develop kind of a really easy, what do you need to do to get ready to go? And I know there's all that Ray said go the information, which is wonderful, but I'm trying to make it really, really simple. Um, so that we, for instance, an example for me is just like, uh, you know, being not only being ready, but basically not waiting until the final warning to go. Like when you get a warning, that's probably time to pack up your animals, pack up your stuff, get out of there. So um, that's something that was news to me. Um, and I'm, I'm so it, it's, it's an ongoing education, but like I said, we've only been doing this for a couple of years. So it's, very exciting 
Hopefully we don't get the fire, but we'll be ready. All right. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thank you. Okay, Dean, if you are ready, uh, you will be up next. Okay, you're hearing me okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, my name is Dean Draven. I'm the president of the Property Owners Association for Oregon Water Wonderland Unit 1. Uh, we're located uh, about six miles south of Sun River. And uh, we are composed of 355 lots owned by approximately 290 owners. Some of the lots are combined. Um, when I got here about 20 years ago, we were probably less than 50% uh, what you would call uh, fire adapted uh, space around the houses, uh, thin trees, limbing, uh, like that. And over the last 20 years, we have improved to the point where we're, I would say, between 90 and 95% um, what we would call uh, Senate Bill 360 compliant. The way we got there is uh, largely due to a, a yearly project that we've had almost without interruption. Um, uh, thanks to grant funding from the county. Uh, it's a sweat equity program where the owners limb their trees, gather all their woody debris, bring it out to the roadside, and then we have a contractor come by and chip all of the woody debris. This has several benefits. The first, obviously, is that the properties are improved on a yearly basis. They get better and better as the years go by. Uh, it's, it's noticeable, the improvement. The second one is, in order for the project to work, you need buy-in from the owners. They have to do the work. That's why it's called sweat equity. And that means that they're involved in improving their property as we do this project. The third thing, that is extremely beneficial for this kind of a project is it gathers its own momentum. In other words, the, the owners are aware of this from year to year so that I don't have to do a great deal to announce that the project is going to be happening. I simply let everybody know in the spring that it's time to get your stuff to the roadside, that we are going to have the chipping project, and that it's probably going to occur sometime in the middle of June. Everybody is aware of it. And even the owners who haven't been here before are made are quickly made aware of it by the their neighbors. So the the education process is ongoing and it's it's self-sustaining. I mean, I, I do the work of putting posters up and uh, issuing uh, notices to the owners, but I really don't have to do that much in order to educate them because, as I said, the momentum continues and grows from year to year to the point where our participation has grown consistently as the years have gone by. And so it's a very successful program. I'm really happy with about what we've done. And I'm looking forward to continuing to do it in the future. The other thing that's contributed to our community becoming safer is, frankly, the amount of construction that's been going on. Uh, obviously, when you build a brand new house, uh, you have to first thin the, the property. Uh, and get rid of all the trees that, that uh, would otherwise occupy it. So we've had, I would say, probably a 30% increase in the amount of structures within our community. We've gone from maybe half of the community being built uh, to now it's approaching two thirds. So we're an improving situation. We're gonna continue to improve. I think that the chipping project is the way to go. And anytime somebody has questions about how they can improve their property, 
and how they can assemble their woody debris, I'm always out there showing them. So, uh, and I owe a great deal to Ed and the county for uh, uh, helping us uh, by providing funds uh, for our sweat equity project. Great, thank you, Dean. Welcome. All right, next up I have Bob with Mountain High. Bob, I'm gonna bring up your presentation here. There it is. <clears throat> Great. Thanks, Ed. I'll just tell you when to advance each slide. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm Bob Poley with the Mountain High uh, Subdivision in Southeast Bend. Um, going to talk about FireWise and our fire-free efforts. A um, little background to advance. A little background about Mountain High. It was developed in the early 1980s by the J.L. Ward Company. We have 252 homes in three villages. Majority of the homes are situated on stands of ponderosa pine that Shevlin Hickson decided not to log back in the early 1900s. And so we have it's a very beautiful park like setting. We have extensive common grass area near the entrance along Mountain High Drive and Mountain High Loop. But one of the problems we have is the developer planted lots of juniper bushes and mugo pines bordering the common areas. And the homeowners also picked up on that idea. So a lot of homeowners have lots of juniper bushes and mugo pines. Next slide, please. <laughs> Uh, we achieved firewise status in uh, November of 2020. I won't go through all of the details, but uh, just the community risk assessment recommendations happened in May, right after COVID broke out. So that was interesting. And Ariel, who is now with OSU Cascades, actually did our community risk assessment. Uh, she did a very nice job. Um, the first thing we did after becoming a firewise community, well, before that, we, we uh, formed a committee. First thing we did after becoming a firewise community was we uh, talked to all the homeowners at our annual meeting in January of 2021. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, our firewise activities, uh, we have a lot. Every month there's a firewise article in our community newsletter. A firewise defensible space framed poster is displayed all summer in our pool house. A lot of people use our pool house, especially with the 90 degree temperatures. Our community members or our committee members provide free home wildfire assessments to homeowners that request them. And there is a firewise presentation at each homeowner annual meeting. Next slide, please. One of the interesting things we do about educating homeowners is uh, the focus on it. And we have committee members that give out brochures and discuss <clears throat> defensible space uh, at drop in sessions at our community gazebo. We partner with a member of the welcoming committee for new residents so that when new residents come in, they have a one-stop shop to learn about the community and also learn about FireWise. Next one, please. <clears throat> Let's talk about how we've used the grant money. In 2021, we received a $2,000 grant from the county and um, all of the projects uh, were completed during fire, or fire free in May of 2021. The first one we did for the first time, uh, we have a 30 cubic yard roll off dumpster, uh, centrally located at our pool house uh, with large banners uh, advertising it to the community as they drove by. That dumpster was filled and emptied three times with 50 homeowners uh, participate. Next one, please. <clears throat> We also uh, decided to try curbside pickup of yard debris because we have some residents uh, who are rather elderly who can't uh, get to the dump and haul their own items, including my next door neighbors. And so uh, we tried that in 2021, uh, only had nine homeowners participate. Next slide. Uh, we did put a large effort in 2021 on cleaning up our common areas. We had a large area between our road and the BNSF railroad right away, which was very overgrown with juniper trees, sagebrush and bitter brush. And our contractor cleared out 82 and a half cubic yards of fuel out of those areas. There's a little before and after shot of one of the areas. Next slide, please. <clears throat> In 2022, our fire free event was um, much better. We received a $2,300 Deschutes County Fuels Reduction Grant. 
our projects uh, were pretty much the same. We had the 30 cubic yard row off dumpster again <clears throat> for two weeks and it was filled and dumped uh, twice, again with the same signage uh, that we had before. And uh, can, uh, I'm sorry, next slide. <clears throat> We also continued the curbside pickup of the yard debris. And this year we had 30 homeowners participating versus the nine that we had in 2021. <clears throat> we picked up 60 yards of debris and had 90 hours of participation from those homeowners. Next one, please. <clears throat> Excuse me. New this year, we had a hot dog lunch celebrating the Firewise National Defensible Space Day on May 7th. Uh, we had 55 brave souls turn out in 46 degree weather. <laughs> it wasn't exactly a hot dog picnic weather. Uh, we did a short presentation on defensible space and we had lots of project welfare brochures uh, distributed at that event. Next one, please. Um, we also removed uh, massive juniper bushes along our knot road fence. They were continual line of about 150 juniper bushes that went all the way from the entrance all the way up to the houses. And so we had every other bush removed by Artisan Tree Works. They do a great job with that little uh, tractor thing. They just pop those juniper bushes right out, roots and all. And so you don't have to worry about them coming back. We have a nice defensible space between each bush now so that we don't have to worry about that. Next slide, please. And in conclusion, uh, just a recap of 2021 versus 2022, uh, we're really small potatoes compared to Ray's uh, efforts in Woodside Ranch. Uh, 197 and a half cubic yards removed and then 178 uh, in 2022, but we had one less week of the dumpsters. So uh, that impacted that a little bit, but we had greater participation, which is the main thing we had. 59 homeowners in 2021, but we had 145 in 2022. So our homeowner hours greatly increased to 325 hours, and our volunteer uh, value increased from 38.4403 to $8,008. And I really want to thank Ed and the county commissioners for the program of having the fuels reduction because. Without it, like Ray says, um, we couldn't afford to do that. And I think most communities would agree, but next slide. Thank you very much for your time. All right, thanks, Bob. Okay, next up I have Gary Miranda. Gary, are you here? I'm here. Great, Gary, I will um, bring up, I just put your photos on one slide. If that works for you. Um, just... Oh, Ed, I'd just like to say when I first asked them to like triple fire free, the county came back to me and said that it was going to cost the county a half a million dollars. And I said, what is one fire going to cost the Shoots County? So um, it's, you know, the cost is there, but truly, is it? you know, just having three weeks, you know, transfer station and then not, I think it's so important. And I'm so proud of the entire community. When I think I first became a commissioner, didn't you have like 35 Firewise communities? Oh, that, now we're yeah. up almost, we're heading towards 70. Yeah. So um, I just want to thank the whole community. I did have a fire go around my house when I lived at the top of the mountain in Malibu, 359 homes burned. And um, truly, I have a lot of stories to say, and the bark is such an issue. Be so careful with bark because somebody with a brand new home it went into the screening and burned that house down in a development down the hill from our house. And it was just because of the screening. So I tell people, if you have an old house, please know that check that screening. You know, it's just such a simple thing to do, but it can save your home. Yep. Yep. Okay, Gary, it's all yours. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'd like to uh, turn this introductory remarks over to my wife, Patricia Cassidy. Patty uh, and I uh, coordinated this project together. I wrote the grant, but we were equally involved in the execution. So she's going to give you some opening remarks. Good morning, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So um, compared to the other presentations, we, I guess, live in a more urban environment. We um, 
We live in Northwest Redmond, in a, a small community called the Cliffs, and it's uh, 44 homes. Um, 22 of them sit on the rim of the Dry Canyon. That's the, the, the Central Park in um, Redmond. Um, and of course, we were concerned that the, the Dry Canyon was going to be our fire nemesis. So we had the assessment team come to our community and much to our surprise, they said, it's not the canyon you should be worried about. It's those arborvitaes that are growing next to your homes. And you can see in this picture, this is pretty typical of what many of the homes had um, around their um, porches and decks for privacy. So we you know, pivoted and switched our focus to getting into the neighbors and talking to the neighbors. Um, so with that, we, we had um, Boone Zimmerly come to our community and we had the Redmond Fire Officer, uh, Chief, of, Chief of Fire come and did a wonderful presentation to our, our neighbors and really got people interested and, um, you know, to a certain extent, I think kind of scared that, you know, things were not looking good around their homes. And we um, made a lot of effort to become a firewise site because we wanted to have some advantage in getting money to help us take down the, the arborvitaes. So, um, you know, we did a lot of legwork in the community, like a lot of you have been talking about, you know, door to door, person to person, uh, giving them a lot of information. And finally, we, we got people to commit to taking their arborvitaes down. And so we kept, you know, very detailed spreadsheets on who, who wanted their arborvitaes down. And, um, and then we, as some of you have said, it's hard finding a contractor to do this, but we found a great arborist who was willing to come in and do the whole project for us. So um, that, that happened in March and in like four days, all of, we had many of the arborvitaes taken down, chipped and taken away off the property. Um, and then I'll tell you a little bit, of, Gary will tell you a little bit about the grant process. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, out of the 44 uh, homes, uh, uh, 22 of them participated in the project. And we were concerned both with trees in the zero to five range and the five to 30 range. Um, in the uh, zero to five range, there were 92 arborvitae trees. And in the uh, five to 30 range, there were 150. Um, the biggest problem we uh, encountered was resistance to taking out the trees that were serving as privacy barriers. Most of these were in the um, five to 30 range. Uh, and in the end, we ended up taking uh, 75 out of the 92 uh, trees that were in the zero to five range out, uh, but we only got around 20 uh, out of the ones that were in the five to 30 range. So then we, uh, we had some, some uh, grant money left over. So we, we sort of shifted to offering to top the trees below the uh, roof lines. Uh, and we got uh, 70 more um, trees out. Uh, people agreed to, even if they didn't want to uh, take them all the way out because of the privacy barrier. Uh, they agreed to top them to, so that they were in a safer place. And we also had to educate people because a lot of people wanted to know what they were going to put up in place of those trees. Uh, my Patty is a, a master gardener and was very helpful in sort of advising people on what trees would be uh, fire safe and, uh, and, and, what, and making suggestions on uh, what to replace the trees with. Um, I think I think that's about about it. Uh, you can see the pictures there. There's a case where there were I don't know, you can see quite a lot of uh, arborvitae trees very close to the house, and uh, you can see the lower pictures where they were in the process of being taken out, and then the last picture is uh, when they were all gone. So this was a really stark example of you know, what that house looked like before and after. And, um, you know, kudos to this family because now they are um, hand digging that dirt area and they're going to put in um, 
you know, fire resistant plants there um, at their at their expense. So um, we I think we did convert a lot of people to the idea that they can have shrubbery, but it can be safer. So I think I think that's our presentation. All right, thank you, thank you both. Uh, and yeah, it's nice to have that diversity of folks. So whether you're in a that more urban setting or uh, or not, it's, these are all really a good diversity of, of examples. So with that, Rob Honaker, I've got you up next. Rod, come on, Rod. Hi, Kelly. Well, good morning. Uh, Rod Boniker. Um, I have a seat on our local um, homeowners association board. They call me the fire czar. Um, and I, I have uh, responsibility for all things fire related um, here in the subdivision. We are, uh, we are called the hill. Um, sounds a little hobbit like. Um, but we are one of the five subdivisions um, that's part of the larger Indian Ford community. Uh, Northeast of Sister Sage Meadow is one of the others we talked about earlier. Um, we're actually the oldest subdivision of the, of the bunch and, and uh, sort of in the middle of the size range. We're not the biggest, but we're not the smallest. There are 61 lots in the hill um, the lots are pretty much all around an acre and, and a quarter in size. Um, 50 of those are owner occupied. It's a, it's a very old neighborhood, but probably half the residents have been here um, for, for 20 or 30 years. I think there's nine long and short term rentals starting to be a lot more short term rentals uh, in the neighborhood. And then there are just two undeveloped lots out of the 61 total lots that we have. We are pretty much surrounded um, by undeveloped private lands, large parcels, two of which are, are uh, owned by the, by the Deschutes Basin Land Trust, um, a couple of large ranches. Um, we, we aren't directly connected except on one side to any other subdivision or developed lands. Most of the, most of the hill is, is occupied by by medium and large uh, ponderosa pine. We're kind of right on the ponderosa pine juniper fringe. Um, so we have a lot of, a lot of big pine um, and a lot of big juniper um, in the neighborhood. Um, the understory is pretty much grass and bitter brush and much like everything else in central Oregon. Um, we are called the hill for a good reason. We're essentially a ridge line that lies um, in the bend of Camp Polk Road. Um, so the, uh, I live on the top of the hill um, and everything, everything is pretty much all the lots uh, are on a slope of some sort. Some of the slopes are, are fairly steep. Um, so we have a lot, of, a lot of potential for terrain driven fire as well as fuels driven fires. We have been a firewise community since 2020 um, we'd actually started doing some work a couple of years before that, um, working with the uh, Camp Sherman Sisters, Camp Sherman Fire Department um, in assessing uh, road access primarily and doing a lot of limbing and trimming and, and removal of trees along our, our uh, shared roads and driveways so that we have better access for fire equipment and for evacuation. Um, we started I'm getting feedback for some reason, Ed, not sure why. But um, we started in, in 2020 with a, with a very small grant from the county um, doing, um, offering uh, debris haul to the neighborhood. And we had a, for 2020 and 2021, we had a very small participation in the neighborhood, 12, 13 homes. Um, we did it during the fire, the fire free weekend and um, we got lots done. It was a good start, but um, the average age of my volunteers at that time was, was 65. Um, now the average age, strangely enough, is about 68. Same volunteers three years later. Um, and it was just more, really more work than, than we could manage. 
um, two or three days of, of loading trailers and, and hauling to the dump. So this last year, we got a larger grant. Um, we hired a, contra a local contractor, a landscape contractor. Um, there were some of the same issues that others had with, with getting those folks um, and then getting them to be able to fit this work in during the fire-free weeks. Um, along with their regular work, everybody is having the same sorts of staffing issues and contracting issues. But we had a stupendous um, response this year. We, we actually, um, the homeowners treat their properties. They, they do the raking and limbing and cleaning and pile everything up um, roadside. And then we come through and pick it up and haul it to the dump. The, with the contractor on board, we actually were able to treat 36 uh, out of the 50 occupied lots uh, in the subdivision. We hauled uh, something over 300 cubic yards of, of material to the dump. Um, about half of that was done by the contractor. The other half was done by me and a group of volunteers um, over several days. We had about 100 hours of volunteer time in the hauling process. We figured roughly 600 hours in sweat equity time from folks cleaning up their own lots. Um, so real successful um, program this year. We, we used sort of the same setup that Raymond talked about first thing this morning where people had to sign up by a certain date, get their material out to the road and, and by a certain date. And uh, for the most part, that, that worked really well. Um, a couple of things that, that we'll, I think we'll do differently next year. Um, I think we, we see that um, we need to put some limits probably on, on what we do simply because we can't get it all done. Um, we had one lot in particular that had never been raked. Um, okay. New owners came in, did an extensive treatment on their, on their ground, um, and we moved about 150 yards of material off that lot, just that lot alone. Um, that ate up about a day and a half of my three days worth of contractor time. So next year, I think we're gonna we're gonna have to limit people um, to to ten yards or a couple of loads or something, so that we can spread the wealth. Um, we ended up having to do quite a bit of work at the end of the process just to make sure that we got everybody that signed up done. Um, the other the other probably most important issue that we ran into was was how people manage their materials. It, you know, it's one thing to load a trailer. Um, with a pile of, of pine needles and pine cones. It's another thing to load a trailer that's a mixed load of pine needles and, and limbs. You have to untangle everything and you can't use a fork and um, it ends up being a much broader job. So we're going to ask people next year to separate their materials a little bit more than we have in the past um, so that we can move them easier. Um, we're also hoping next year to get enough money to, to get a chipper um, and have a contractor with a chipper come through and, and place a little more focus on some of the longer term treatments. We've essentially been moving the annual buildup of needles and pine cones that people have in their yards. Um, I'd like to do a lot more thinning and limbing um, on the lots and, and get that large material out of here. And that's gonna involve probably a little bit bigger operation. Um, we, next year, we hope to, or over the winter, we hope to expand our education outreach um, from the Homeowners Association. Uh, lots of new folks here, um, still a few folks that are resistant to um, any kind of treatment of their property. Um, they, they like the way it looks and, and they don't see any reason to change the way it looks. So uh, we need to do a little bit more work to, to reach those folks and, and convince them that it's a community issue. Um, and then finally, something that I hope to do this fall and winter is a, a sort of a small prescribed fire clinic. Uh, because of the slopes we have, it's not really feasible to rake and haul material in many of the lots. Um, and so people, people really are still in position to have a, having to do some small debris burning. And, and that's a, there's been tension and conflict in the neighborhood over smoke and risk of escape from people burning piles. Um, and as an old Forest Service fuels treatment guy, there I know that there are safe ways 
an efficient way is to burn pine needles that, that can reduce the impact on our neighbors. Um, and we're gonna focus on teaching people how that can be done um, so that we can get some more of that material that we can't otherwise haul away. And I think that's all I have, Ed. Thanks. Thanks, Rod. Okay, Ruth, it's over to you. Bring up the presentation today. Hmm? Are you going to bring up the presentation today? Did you send me one? Uh, I did, and you said you had it yesterday. Okay. Uh, there it is. There we go. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I, yeah. No problem. <laughs> uh, I'm Ruth Bauman with the Alki Woods Fractional HOA. Uh, we started our program last year. It was our first year. Uh, we started in June and got our fireways uh, designation in uh, late August, early September. I'm going to focus more on uh, some of the lessons that we learned in that process, particularly for new groups that are coming up. I'm going to change this one. So we're located southwest of Bend on Century Drive. We are surrounded on three sides by the Widget Creek Golf Course. We have neighboring communities of, of uh, another town hall community, El Alpi Woods, Points West, and Mile Post One. And then the end of Seventh Mountain is nearby us, so we have traffic from that. The National Forest surrounds most of our area. We do have the Deschutes River uh, flowing below us off of a cliff behind our community. Last year, we had two small fires on the property, one due to an auto accident on community uh, on uh, Century Drive where you know, they hit it, got into the uh, needles and the tree and then caught the fire around. Fortunately, the golf course uh, folks were able to put that out. And then we had a second one that came up from the river. Um, source of that was unknown, but it came up uh, close to the golf course and that was put out rather quickly. But it, it showed everybody what happens when you get fire. Um, so if you want to advance the slide. This is a picture of the uh, aerial picture of our neighborhood. Uh, so as you can see, we have tall ponderosa pines on uh, yeah, out in the forest. Our community itself has uh, got nice shade from all of those pines. We uh, these are townhomes. Uh, so our our uh, the first thing we want to do in our first year in our plan was to get the yellow area, which is the northwest perimeter of our property. We chose that area because it faces the direction of uh, traditional fires that have come through. The Aubrey Hall fire is just up the road from us. So the fires tend to come that direction and we have prevailing winds from that direction as well. Then we chose to do on our plan uh, for year two would be the blue section. But you can see that little part there, which is a uh, faces a meadow uh, between our two homeowner associations. And that's where a lot of decks also face that area. We chose that as a second area of interest because that's where a lot of human activity occurs. That's where people grill, people go out on our decks and smoke. So if we're going to have a fire, we're probably going to start it. And that would be a good area. So we wanted to get that one cleaned up. And then lastly, along the uh, purple line there is the, the uh, road that goes through the neighborhood. And that's fronted with uh, a lot of junipers, um, lugo pines, and other types of flammable material. We have natural breaks in that area with the roadway and sidewalks between homes. So that was why it was our third area of, um, of attack. Um, we were able last year to get a contract with Mike the tree guy who came in and did a lot of work. They were pretty quick and efficient. And we actually got all three areas of those cleaned up last year. We have one small, some, some leftover things as we've gotten things cleaned out and found there's a little bit more to be done which will get done uh, actually this week, hopefully, if he's able to come out. One of the things that was really helpful for us when we started the process is, you know, the risks were overwhelming. You know, if you read all the materials, it's like, oh my God, we've got all this stuff we've got to do. This is kind of a summary and a, 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 a way to visualize the risk process using the FireWise application and the risk scoring in that uh, particular tool. And so this gave us a quick visual to see, you know, if we look at structural things like our vents, windows, things, the roofs, those things, we actually had really high compliance with them. Uh, we just replaced the roofs with wire-wise type materials a couple of years ago. Um, so you can see it was easy to zone in on. Fuel was the number one thing for us that we really had to, to deal with. We also had issues with skirting under the decks and the decks themselves, which are the attachments. 
However, one of the things that was really helpful when um, Jeff Bond from the fire department came out and talked to us about it, he, he reiterated the fact that those things are not going to start on fire unless you have fuel next to them and something else that takes off and something else that increases the heat load. So we were able to focus on the areas that were most important to us where we were not in compliance, and that's what we did in the last year. So some of the lessons that we learned is that, again, we have to weigh the risks in the context of our environment. Our big pines that, that everybody in the community was worried we'd have to take out are actually protecting our homes because it protects it from embers flying in from other areas, particularly from the Deschutes National Forest across the street. So that really helped us say, okay, we don't need to worry about that. What we really need to worry about is the stuff very close to the home. Uh, so that helped us quite a bit. Um, some of the vegetation, as I said, could be our friends. Those pines are helping us a lot. And then it's important for everybody to know that there's gonna be some sacrifice. You know, Somebody's favorite shrub is gonna to have to be taken out. And we have to constantly tell folks that, you know, we're not gonna put back what we took out. We're gonna put back some of what we took out. Uh, we have a lot of folks in our area who um, have summer homes there. You know, they come from the uh, Portland area, they come from Seattle, and they want to duplicate what they have in Portland and Seattle. And I have to reiterate, we don't have the soil or weather conditions, so it's not going to look like that. That's a continual education effort for us. Some of the keys to our, our success were setting our goals. So we made sure people really, really understood what it meant to be fire wise and how to make the community safe. We had to find a place to start uh, because it was overwhelming at first. And that's where we started with kind of looking at it from a geographic standpoint. Um, we have to keep reminding ourselves we can't do everything uh, at once and we have to spread it out over time. Um, like any project, we needed to be agile and uh, understand that obstacles would get in our course. We had times when our contractor was, was coming through um, and he's like, okay, I got all of that done, now what? And luckily we had a longer range plan, so we always had something else we could feed him. Um, we had somebody on site with the contractor so that we could answer his questions, deal with uh, any of the community members, make decisions, and make sure that the work got done properly. Um, while planning for threats of fire coming in the community, it was important for us to remember we can also start the fire. So that's what we're trying to confront this year is looking at our HOA rules and what do we need to do to, to make sure we're not the, the people that start the fire in our own backyards. And so that's pretty much what we've uh, been able to accomplish. Uh, this year we will have another plan. Uh, we have some common areas that we need to clean out and some areas that are in the next zone that we'll be working on in the, in the coming year. Great, thank you, Ruth. Uh, all right, next up we have Don Rosenfeld. Good morning, everybody. Um, so we represent the um, the community called Timber Ridge. We're located in Southeast Bend and um, along uh, off of Country Club Road. We have uh, 54 acres and 87 homes in our community. And we're bordered on one side by the BSF, BNSF Railroad and the other side by uh, Bend Country Club. And um, we became a FireWise community uh, just a year ago. And so when we got our grant, we tied it in with our action plan for our FireWise. Um, so we, um, our efforts were pretty much focused on the 100 foot defensible space behind a number of homes that backed up to the railroad. And in that area, there's just a lot of um, bitter brush, sagebrush, a lot of dead debris. Um, so that was our focus. And we had, um, well, I'll, I'll mention this, to our benefit in our community, twice a week, um, we have GTI, it's a landscape company, and they come in and they will pick up any kind of debris that homeowners put out on their lawn on tarps. And so this is twice a week uh, during summer, spring and fall and once a week during the winter. So there's a large amount of um, homeowners putting their, their, their own debris out on tarps. Um, and <clears throat> we educated them about that through the quarterly newsletter that um, our HOA puts out. So um, 
that was incredibly helpful. I don't know how many cubic yards, but I'm sure there's a lot because um, that dump truck that comes through, it's full a couple times every time they come through. Um, so anyways, ours was kind of a grassroots effort as, getting, as far as getting community members to help us along that specific area along the railroad track. So what we did is we had four Saturday morning uh, work days from nine to 12. And, you know, it's got, getting people to volunteer and help. I, I tell people it's kind of like at church functions, you know, you have a handful of people that do all the volunteer work. Um, but we had probably an average of eight people every Saturday morning on those work days show up. And we had a, a big trailer that we filled and it was really successful. We just from those four Saturdays with eight people, I think we had a total of 65 cubic yards of debris hauled away. And it was interesting trying to get new people every Saturday to help out. The last community work day, the normal group of folks that would normally help and volunteer, only one showed up that day. And my wife and I thought, oh, it's just gonna be a couple of us helping. And within 15 minutes, we had eight new people that had never showed up come and help. So a lot, a lot of it, I think, is by word of mouth and encouraging other homeowners to get involved. Um, uh, what else? Um, I'm just looking at my notes here. Um, we have, uh, uh, just a minute here. Oh, yeah, yeah. My wife's here. She, she's my left hand. Uh, <laughs> We, uh, we actually also hired out uh, an arborist who did considerable amount of tree trimming uh, in that area that we focused on. So, um, and then there again was, I don't know many, how many hundred yards of debris that was hauled out. And then our HOA matched a thousand dollars and that was used as well for tree trimming along um, Country Club Drive. Um, And I, I kind of think that's, that's it. We, we continue to, any new homeowners that move into the neighborhood, they're given a packet, a Firewise packet. And, um, and then we meet with them. And if they're interested in getting a review of how they can decrease or uh, uh, increase safety around their homes in the defensible space, um, we're more than happy to uh, talk with them and just encourage them. And I think that's it. Great, thank you, Don. And uh, I gotta say, I really liked your a couple of your pictures that you sent. So thank thank you for those uh, in your report. <laughs> yeah, and it was you know we, we're in a small community. There's only 87 homes, but honestly, having those work days and working alongside other people, I think um, it's developed more of a community, um, and people are. They just seem like they really, they're really encouraged to work together and get to know one another. And it's really helped build community in our neighborhood. So we hope that that will grow in the coming years. Great, thank you. Okay, Greg, you are up. I'm up, okay. Uh, my name's Greg Bryan, I'm Patricia's Rural Woods, number one. Uh, we got 176 residences, but I sort of expanded that for, the, for, the, for what we're doing here. Uh, what, what I came up with was three 20 cubic feet, cubic yard dumpsters in three different locations within the Shrewsbury Woods, and they had to be on property, private property. So that was sort of a, you had to find them big enough for them to put that on their property and also have people to back up to put, put the debris into that. And we have approximately three websites that we use to update people as to what's going on with that. And we started this right after the fire free at the landfill. It was, in, it was May 6th, 16th. We had, it, we had the, dump, the dumpsters out there for five weeks. We dumped about, there was 300 cubic yards and was taken to the landfill. I, used, I made three, three signs on each of them so that as people came up to them, they knew what they were supposed to be putting in. And I also noted that if anything else was being put in there, if anybody noticed that, make an ID and they call me. Nobody called me. That's a good thing. 
And what it was is uh, Cascade Disposal said that in most cases, if they had a dumpster out there, that there would be other stuff other than yard that be debris put in there. And I checked every night, every dumpster, and there was wasn't anything put in to the dumpster, which was good. Now, what it was is uh, I didn't know it when my first bit of was. Cascade disposal, you have to give them a week notice to come, come pick up the dumpster. So in other words, every, every week I would, I'd have them come pick it up and say, okay, now in a week, come and pick it up again. And usually the dumpsters would be full. Once they brought them back, they'd be full within two or three days. And so I had to tell through these websites, okay, the, this one's the full, this one's full, this one's got 50% capacity, so you can use this one. And so those are things that I had to do. And so the hardest thing was to get finding the three locations, like I said, big enough for, for and they, and they also the all homeowners had to agree to it. Because there were several homeowners said, no, I don't want a liability. I don't want to go and do something else with this location. So those are some, certain things I had to do. And I also told them, uh, since this is for five weeks, you know, this is a marathon, not a sprint. You know, we, you got time to get this done. And also it's an educational thing that we, we go through. Other than that, uh, I, I want to thank the county commissioners and, and Ed for giving us this grant. Uh, and everybody was appreciative that, that, that we could use it. Now anticipate that there's probably uh, 75 or 80 people, uh, residents would probably use, use this for a period of time. Thank you, that's all. Okay, great. Thanks, great. All right, Suzanne Butterfield. Yeah. You're up. Thanks, Ed. Uh, uh, Suzanne Butterfield with Aubrey Park HOA. Uh, we're on Aubrey Butte, 132 homes and a few undeveloped lots. Um, the Deschutes River Trail is down below us. Mount Washington Drive is up above us. So there's opportunities for you know uh, fires to start from those locations. Um, I wanted to say that uh, our experience is very similar to everybody else's experience. We've been FireWise certified for three years and received grants for three years. So what I'd like to do is uh, uh, instead spend my few minutes on some things that I've learned in the last hour. Uh, uh, and that is that uh, now that uh, the program is becoming so extremely popular and you're looking at maybe 67 ish communities that are going to be that are designated firewise uh, the money isn't going to go as far and so I think we all need to be uh, thinking in terms of being very efficient with that money so one thought I had as people have been talking and picking up all these wonderful ideas is that if the county uh could uh, identify what you consider to be the best educational material that we could be giving our um, homeowners. It sounds like we all have an educational component as well as debris pickup. And uh, I, that's something I would really appreciate is what is the best material we could uh, distribute? Um, another uh, idea might be what about uh, the county coordinating more or trying to get more uh, involvement uh, from the nurseries that are selling plants. Perhaps there could be some sort of a, a public information campaign where there's posters or something at uh, nurseries where people go to buy their plants. Um, so that's another thought. Uh, you know, we're all struggling to find private contractors who uh, can do this work unless we uh, uh, have the garbage company put a dumpster out. But the beauty of having the private contractors is, is that they'll, you know, you come uh, to each person's um, driveway and pick up the stuff. Uh, but, um, you know, maybe the contractor should be notified that there's an opportunity here and, uh, you know, how can they participate? Um, <coughs> Another thought I had is that perhaps uh, some of us could have uh, designated demonstration houses where there's uh, certain houses in the community where they've done things exactly right. 
and it, it's uh, it's nice for people to be able to see that in the neighborhood and get a better idea. Um, another thought might be uh, talking to insurance companies. I got an interesting letter from Safeco, our insurance company, uh, and it said uh, during a I think during a fire. Uh, we may send someone to do certain things at your house. Uh, I can't remember what all it was, but I was kind of surprised to read that. And I thought you really would do that. Um, mm -hmm. and is it no cost to you? Uh, th this is now part of your insurance policy. So just a thought that perhaps uh, the insurance companies might be interested in contributing to the um, grant program. Um, and then the last thing I think that I'll mention is that uh, I, so many of us are HOAs, we probably all have architectural guidelines and those architectural guidelines have got to be consistent with FireWise. And uh, so I think uh, we all may have some rewriting to do of those architectural guidelines where perhaps in the past we encouraged uh, um, doing certain um, landscaping that is not appropriate anymore. Uh, and I think that's about it for me. You know, sure, I'm extremely grateful for the grant. And uh, I just feel like we've got to all think in terms of how efficiently can we operate to stretch that money farther and hopefully increase the amount of money because the public private partnerships that have been created listening to all these fantastic stories uh, is a tremendous, uh, you know, I think we're, we're getting you know, tremendous matches in volunteer time um, uh, to the, the county's money. Thanks, folks. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, some great thoughts there. Uh, I had one more, but I don't see uh, that they are here, and that would have been uh, Eric Moyerman. Eric, are you here and I'm just missing you? Okay, he sent me a message at 11.30 last night saying, here's my PowerPoint slides for tomorrow night's meeting. So he may have had a AM, PM mix up. So <laughs> I'll have to track him down so he's not uh, at eight o'clock tonight trying to get into this meeting. Um, so I'm sorry, we'll miss out on Sundance as they were a newer Firewise community. But I, I think we did get a, the intent was to kind of get, get a good flavor of what's going on across the county. Uh, and I really appreciate those that were willing to kind of uh, give, give those presentations. Uh, there are several other people that are that are in the room and on the call that um, definitely did projects as well. So I just want to acknowledge this was just a sampling of some of those uh, and just an opportunity to share. So with that, um, we just have about ooh, a little less than 15 minutes left uh, on the meeting. I do have one announcement towards the end. I just open it up for any questions or comments. Uh, and maybe I would just, before I turn over to Zoom, start in the room, if anybody had anything real briefly to bring up. I was wondering if any of the HOAs have within the information that goes to a new buyer, like for example, coupled with their CCNRs, the FireWires information. Because if, you know, it sounds like there's programs to initiate the home buyer once they're in their house. But if the if the firewise information can go to the person as part of the the CCNRs that are distributed to them prior to them purchasing a house, that's kind of one step ahead of the game. They've already they already know we're moving into a firewise community, which actually I would think most people would see as being very beneficial. Yeah. And and they kind of they're kind of armed to begin with to know you know well this is a community that has certain expectations in terms of fire safety. I didn't know if any communities were distributing that information at that point. I, I was looking to Chrissy because I was wondering if like Tree Farm or, or uh, Discovery West did that. But, we have um, not. Okay. That. All right. I was just curious. We probably could not. <laughs> um, I, know, I know there's a few communities that do have some um, firewise components of their CCNR, so they would be kind of built into that process. Uh, yeah, we do. Okay. In our CCNRs, we do have uh, our landscape requirements, we do have firewise built into that. And we also have a very active welcome committee that goes out and actually presents the CCNRs to the homeowner and explains them in detail along with all of our firewise brochures. So. 
I know uh, last year I gave out a thousand Firewise cards and it had the 10 rules on the back of it and realtors saw them and asked me for, you know, so I gave realtors those cards so they can hand out, um, you know, the really good rules. So um, I just think that's really, you know, like very efficient. And one thing I would be remiss in saying the fire that went around our house, three people died in that fire. Uh, and, you know, I, when I thought about it, I thought, you know, that's really the really tragic loss of a fire is losing people and always knowing when you need to go. Uh, last year, the Grand Rue fire was down the road from me a ways, but I actually moved all my animals the first night because um, you don't want to move young horses in the middle of them, you know, in a, in under those kind of situations. So yeah, you really you've got to have your grow, go bags ready to go. And um, truly, three people died, and one of it was was an older couple. They didn't leave their home soon enough. The other person was looking for their cat, and um, you know, so tragedy, tragedy. Yeah. Okay, we've got a few people online with their hands up. Um, and I know I'm probably going to pronounce your name wrong. We weren't, uh, you, you left me a voicemail. And, <laughs> but, uh, um, uh, Lourdes? Oh, this is me. <laughs> Hi. Uh, first, thank you so very much to all uh, the owners that have been presenting today. I We just became a Firewise community, and so I learned uh, more things that can be done. Uh, we are going to apply for the grant. And one of my first question is, and I will probably ask that question on August 2nd with the Deschutes County meeting, but um, when you apply for the grant, do you have to have a, uh, estimate, an exact estimate of how much it's going to cost to have a cheaper or a dumpster or things like that? Whoever wants to answer that. <laughs> I can answer that. Um... I would say an approximate estimate would be good. Uh, do a little homework so you're in the ballpark, but it doesn't have to be doesn't have to be exact. Um, there's just a lot of variables that go in that are are, are somewhat unknown uh, as far as how much participation and how many times you might move dumpsters. But um, I think you could definitely, you know, if you go that route, for example, get some get some good estimates and have some something to base it on. Yeah. And talking about participation, my other question, and I think it's um, uh, Bob at Mountain High who was saying that uh, you were mentioning the number of people who were involved in your community. How did you find um, the best way to gather the amount of people that were in invested in the project? It's all uh, communication, primarily through our newsletter. We start advertising that we're gonna have the event, um, we start in, um, I think it's March, uh, aggressively advertising that get ready because the end of April is coming. And right after the end of April, we do fire free either the end of April or the first part of May typically. So we, uh, we have a, a monthly newsletter. So every month we tell them to get ready and what we're gonna have an overview of the components. So that right, they but, can but but sorry, but how do you how do you get to know how many people were involved? Because you mentioned at some point there were one hundred and something people. How did you get that uh, number? Well, by the curbside pick up the, the number of people there, number okay. of people that attended the luncheon. Uh, I have the dumpsters monitored uh, so that we know at the end of each day how many new loads showed up, and every load looks different. So you know that <laughs> there's there's at least one homeowner that did that load and it was on an average of two hours of their work to get that amount. So it, it's uh, it's not hard and fast science, but you can do good estimates. Good estimation. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, great. Uh, Gary. Yeah, I just, you know, uh, when I was the Firewise advisor for nine states and working with Dr. Jack Cohen out of Missoula and developing curriculum for NFPA, um, one thing he would continue to say and something I observed when I went out and I still do when I go out and I do home assessments that people are doing a lot of work about removing the fuels around the home. But we have to remember that the majority of the homes that are igniting are igniting for members and these embers are coming a mile two miles three miles and sometimes even up to four miles away they're igniting these homes so even though you have a fire resistive roof you have to look at the projections of the roof too that means 
that we have to be looking at the tiered roof lines and where we have vertical areas under those roof lines that are made out of wood and even the dormers. The dormers are usually made out of wood. So these embers collect up against those dormers and ignite the wood, even though you had a fire resistive roof. So it's really important to clean those gutters, clean your roof off, even though it's fire resistive. And also the other place that's the most vulnerable besides that roof, and that is around the base of the house. We have to look at that five foot area. We got to get the bark chips out. We have to get those flammable plants away from the home. It's not so much that the embers are falling on top of a wood deck. That is not is what's starting the fire. It's the embers that are falling up next to the deck, underneath the deck, and then burning underneath the deck and taking out the home. Or if you have cushions uh, on your chairs and you've left for the weekend, or you have other flammable things up against that wood siding. A lot of people think that because they have uh, fire resistive siding, such as you know your, your concrete siding, such as hardy board, or if you have a stucco home, those components are against a plywood or a wood um, structural part behind it. And often when you have flammable plants and bark chips up against your home, even though you have that fire resistive or non-combustible siding, it's going to ignite the wood possibly underneath that. And because you have a high heat area with the bark chips that are burning and it's burning back behind that uh, non-combustible siding. So there's a lot of maintenance and we need to push that out to the people that these are the two most vulnerable areas, your roof, and that five foot area and around the decks. And so focus on that. Even though you're focus on, focusing on stuff 30 feet and 60 feet away, that might help reduce the chance of that surface fire from spreading to your home. But we gotta remember that the majority of homes are burning from the embers that are jumping over the top of that area onto your roofs, right into the five foot area around your home. That's all I have to say. Great. I can't we can't emphasize that enough, right, Gary? So it's, it's always good to uh, repeat that, just like I kicked off at the first of the meeting, talking about Sage Meadows project there. So Dean, you've had your hand up for a minute or two. Uh, got something quick for, uh, running down on time. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, Keith. <clears throat> uh, Ed, uh, uh, very briefly, I want to mention that uh, UDRC has received uh, more than one grant over the years from BNSF uh, Railroad. And uh, I heard a couple of uh, communities talking about their exposure to the railroad and their concerns. And so you might want to look into that. Uh, uh, and they were generous with us and they allowed us uh, to use those funds for um, um, uh, fuel reduction um, within like a mile or two from the railroad even for the various communities. And uh, also briefly, uh, pine needles. Um, uh, I've seen a lot of property owners that are obsessive about pine needles and they, and they end up raking acres of them. But uh, like Gary was saying, it's, it's very important, uh, like five feet around your houses and decks. And, uh, um, and so uh, that might help you focus better. Thanks. Thanks, Dean. And we're probably going to have more interest than uh, extra comments at the time. I would just say uh, we plan to uh, maybe have a couple of uh, other opportunities for Firewise communities to uh, network either in future Project Wildfire meetings or uh, even separate meetings. Uh, I do want to call attention to something I put in the chat just so everybody's aware because this does affect a lot of people. Uh, Oregon Department of Forestry is planning a public meeting uh, right now set for August 10th at the fairgrounds. Uh, I believe it might start at seven, but those details are still being finalized. Uh, just got the room reserved to them yesterday, uh, but they will be here in town or in Redmond. Um, uh, so open to all folks at Central Oregon to talk about the new state wild, wild, wildfire risk map that's now available on the Oregon Explorer website. So um, you could probably have a full meeting on that map, but um, that will be for August 10th. So. Um, so mark your calendars and come with questions. Uh, uh, I, I 
definitely had a lot of people calling about appeals and uh, questions on the risk map. So that's really the meeting to, to come and talk about that. So definitely get that on your calendar. And I will include uh, more details when we put out our newsletter on August 1st on that, uh, on that meeting. So look for that. Um, with that, if you've got something really quick, uh, David or Frank, um, I'll go with David first, and then we're going to kind of conclude the meeting for today. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yep. yep. Okay, I got a, just a couple quick questions. Um, that might be premature, but who will be enforcing this program? Will it be Deschutes County? Senate Bill 762. Or what right that will uh that will be well that's for another time i would i would say come to the meeting on the 10th and find out some more details that would to unpack that would probably be an hour long answer honestly <laughs> okay and then uh, uh, there's most, multiple components that include 11 different state agencies uh some are enforceable and some are more incentive based and it's uh it's a more complicated answer than we have time for unfortunately okay Thank you for that. Um, last question is, is the defensible space defined the same way as FireWise defines it? Um, <laughs> maybe. Uh, the defensible space code is still being finalized, I guess is what I'd say. And so uh, it may look slightly different because it's going to be based on the International Code Council's uh, WUI code. Uh, and uh, the International Code Council is not... It, the National Fire Protection Association. So I think there's going to be some similarities, but they may not look exactly the same. Uh, yeah, that's probably the shortest answer I can give you for now. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Yeah, we will have a, a full code um, by January and we'll have a better picture of what that looks like. So uh, I just want to respect everybody's time. Uh, I, we could probably go on another half an hour, but I'm going to go ahead and conclude the meeting. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, sorry, I couldn't get to everybody today, uh, including a round of roundtables. If you all have um, updates you want me to share out through the notes, um, you can send them my way in email. And I really do appreciate everybody taking the time to put together those presentations. Uh, I thought they were great, they really illustrated a good diversity of, of projects. Um, so thank you all, and have a good rest of your July. We'll see you back here in, in August, hopefully. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Happily in August first. Thank you very much.